Okay, so um, this is my crash course primer view on how to analyze the data that you collect. Uh, so what I've got here is a sample data set, uh, which I've erased most of the items from, but I've got enough here for us to work from. So your data analysis has four basic steps here. One, check the raw data. Two, compute your scales. Three, check your scales. And then four is where you get on and analyzing it. Uh, so we'll just roll through that more or less in, in order. And this is the strange voice that people adopt when they're recording things where they start saying, we'll do this and we'll do that. Uh, so I'm already feeling a little self-conscious, but life is okay. So number one, uh, checking your raw data. Uh, so when you download your data from Qualtrics or wherever you get it from, uh, if you use Qualtrics, you can actually export it uh, into SPSS directly. You, you can choose to download SPSS data, and so it arrives looking something a bit like this. Um, although the variable labels are usually a bit less coherent. They usually Q underscore 27.3 or, or something like that. Uh, so I've already done some translating here. Uh, so the first thing that you do when you get your data is you want to just, um, the SPSS has two tabs here. There's variable view, which lists the variables, version time to do, loyal one, loyal two, merge, mat, SWB. Um, and it tells you the width and how many decimal places and a label. Often it's very helpful to put a label in here. Um, Qualtrics will download your data with very strange names uh, and labels, which if you've used labeling of the questions will actually give you a, a useful label. Um, values, uh, they, they sometimes have them. Uh, so uh, it might be something like this. Uh, which product uh, value could be um, one if it's a phone and add and two if it's other. Uh, I think this data set, I mostly have one as a phone add. Okay. Um, uh, and, and the other thing that you want to get right here is make sure that scale, um, you've got the right kind of question. So it, they can be scale ordinal or nominal, uh, and that's something you learned about in your class, so you want to make sure you've got the right one. For the most part, it's not vital, but it's worth checking. So if I go over here and I find which prod, right, um, this is the one I labeled, uh, there's a tag button here called value labels, and if I click that, it now shows me my labels, phone, 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 other, phone, 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 other. I think uh, I asked people if they had a phone, and if they said no, then I asked them about something else. So these are most people had phones. Um, and you can click off uh, the labels here. So it switches back and forth between an, a number and the word. Now, you might ask, why am I using numbers at all? Why don't I just put in the word phone or other? Uh, and the answer is SPSS isn't very good at coping with strings. It isn't very good at coping with strings of letters like Samsung or iPhone or ZTE. Uh, it does much better if you say, which data should I analyze? Everything where which product is equals to one, uh, it, it'll, uh, it can do that. If you say everything where the string includes Android, it'll get confused. So generally speaking, if you've got a condition that you manipulate, that people get one condition or another, you want to code those as one and two or a zero and one or a one and minus one it doesn't ultimately matter what you choose what numbers you choose um, but if you give it numbers and then put a label on it so you can remember which is which but that's generally the the most helpful way to go around doing it so let's think what else do we want to do here um, so first of all it's worth just inspecting your numbers to get familiar with it um, and then look for what kind of hits you. So sometimes you see a bunch of missing data here. Um, here you see there's no phone number. Then you look and you go, ah, right, that's because they weren't asked about phones. There's no loyalty scores. Ah, that's because those questions asked about how loyal you were to your phone. There were different questions about how you asked how loyal you were to some other product. So that's right. Um, whereas there, this same person does have scores for materialism and these personality variables and gender that everyone was asked about. Uh, 
it looks like this question is blank, and if you scroll down, you'll see that they pick up here. This is because I, I started running this data set, and then I realized, hey, wait, I could ask them this other question, and I added it to my uh, Qualtrics survey halfway through. Uh, so number of you know, <laughs> data suddenly starts halfway through the data set for this one question. Um, uh, and so you, you can actually see things like this uh, hard-coded into your data set. Uh, let's see what's going on here. Um, so yeah, you can see people who have uh, done things. You can see um, questions um, that were on very different scales. So you can see this demand scale, you're getting 59, 49, whereas all these other ones are 1, 2, 3, 1, 3, 8, 3, you know, minus, this one has minus 2, minus 1. Um, and so if you know what your questions are, you can think about whether that's a sensible thing that should be there or whether it's uh, uh, some kind of mistake. Uh, and mistakes do happen. So I had a survey once where I looked at the, the data and some question that should have been 1 to 9, the numbers went 1, 2, 3, 1, 3, 4, 5, 15, 1, 3, 5, 19, 1, and it just jumps out at you, these 15, 19. And it turns out that Qualtrics had recorded 1 as 1, 2 as 2, 3 as 3, 4 as 4, 5 as 5, and then 6 as 17, and 7 as 18, and 9 as 19. Um, so once you knew that that was there, um, it was pretty easy to correct. Uh, so let, let's look at these menus. Um, there are three, no, I mean, other than file, you, you use data, transform, and analyze. Those are basically the only three tabs that you're, you're going to use in your analysis. Um, so you, you can go to transform, and somewhere in here you can go recode into the same variable, uh, and, and so if something like that has happened, you could say, let's say, demand, we've got a problem. You can say all the new values, and then you can say, okay, if if I'm seeing 15, that really should become a 5, because it's supposed to be a 5. And you add that. Um, and if there's a 16, that's supposed to be a 6. And we'll add that, and then continue. Uh, and so, uh, and then if I press OK, uh, it'll carry out that transformation. And I'm not going to do that because that's not really the case in my data set. But this is one uh, kind of problem that you can very much solve if you spot it. And so it's worth having a look at your raw data to see things like that. Uh, right. So having looked at our data and decided that it's OK, um, we can start trying to compute our scales. Because when you get it, you will have, and I've cut it off here, you'll have something like materialism one, materialism two, materialism three, materialism, blah, 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 blah. Um, and you might have 15 different materialism items, but you don't want to try and analyze those separately where the 15 different items all predict things on their own. You want to combine them all into one. So this is step two, computing scales. Um, now. The way you do this, remember our three tabs, data, transform, analyze. The first option under transform is compute variables. So um, we are going to compute a new variable. We can give it a name. We can call it whatever we like. Let's say mat for materialism. Uh, and then we can scroll down the list and find our first materialism item. Uh, and then we can scroll down and we can find Oops, let's put a space in there. You can find another materialism item, uh, and you can go on. Now, on its own, uh, we, we've got an equation here, materialism equals, and then this thing, right? Now, if, if, let, let's say that there were three materialism items only. Oh boy, I put it in the middle. Um, let's say there were three materials, so you can just type in here. You can. Uh, type in stuff directly. You don't have to go through the drag and drop menu. One way to calculate an average mole is you can say, you can just type it in like an equation. This plus, oops, plus, where's plus? This plus this, and then say divide it by three, and that would compute materialism, uh, you know, an average of those three. But there's a problem here, um, which is Sometimes, you can see over here, someone will have not answered a question. 
So if I took the average of those three, uh, you know, eight plus nothing plus seven, and divided it by three, I would get a loyalty score that was much too low, uh, right? Because the average of this person's loyalty scores is really seven and a half. But if you added eight and seven and divided it by three, it would be, I don't know, 15 divided by three, would be five. So there's a trick to avoid this, which is uh, there's a built-in function for calculating means. So you just type mean, oops, I made it caps, doesn't really matter if it is or not. Uh, and then you comma, comma, get rid of that. So if I type material mat or materialism equals mean of mat one, mat two, and mat three, uh, it will compute the mean for me. And if there's missing data, it'll divide it by the right number. Uh, now I could press OK, and it would calculate that score for me right now. But there's this button that you will come to know and love right next to OK called paste. If I click paste, uh, change existing variable, I already have one called materials, and I'll say OK. Um, you get this syntax window. Syntax is the commands that, if I data set activate, they set one, and it puts that at the beginning. You don't read that uh, unless you open several different data sets at once, which you're not going to do. It says compute mat equals mean mat1, mat2, mat3, um, and this is just a text file. You can add for mat 4s, mat 5s, uh, although you've got to make sure you don't make mistakes and forget an underscore or something. Um, and then you say if I want to compute the scale, I can cut that and paste it and paste it and paste it and then say this new one uh, will be desk. And then I can even put spaces in so it all lines up better. Um, equals, um, and you can put in BESC1 and BESC2 um, and things like that. And then each one ends in a full stop. Um, and here's how this works. Uh, I'm going to make give this a different name. Matt. Kill me, uh, ask, <laughs> kill me, just so I remember to delete it. Uh, I'll delete that. So uh, I highlight those, and then also the execute, because otherwise if I don't highlight execute, it'll just sit there, and it won't do anything. Uh, and then I push this green play button, run selection, and it goes bonk. And if I look at my data set, over here, it's added a variable on the end. It should have done. Oh dear, what's going on? Uh, output. Whoops. It says incorrect variable name. Aha. Aha. Uh -huh. Oh yes. So um, <laughs> I, I, I've told it variable names that don't exist, and that's why it's throwing an error. Uh, so let's just go back to my syntax window and we'll get rid of this <laughs> and we'll <laughs> this is what you find yourself doing a whole lot uh, is running stuff and then it throws an error and you go what why did it throw an error and then you go back and look at it and work out why so if I run this here okay Matt kill and uh, here it is Matt kill me and if I go to data view here it is um, Uh, I'm going to delete it now because it's not a real scale. Uh, but that's the beginnings of how you compute a scale. Now, there's another wrinkle. Um, I'm going to open up an Excel file here. So here is uh, the materialism scale. These are the names that Qualtrics gave it. I just cut and pasted it from the SPSS into Excel. This is the actual... Uh, items, so materialism, 15 item, number one is I admire people who own expensive cars and homes, and number two is some of the most important achievements in life include acquiring mere material possessions. Uh, item number three, I don't place much emphasis on the amount of material objects people own as a sign of success. Now, if you look at it, this question 
is reversed. It's phrased backwards. If you're very materialistic, you would say, yes, you know, seven out of seven. I admire people who own expensive cars and homes. Uh, but then when you get to this item, you'd say, I don't put so much emphasis on the amount of objects people own. If you're very materialist, you'd say, no, one, I disagree. Uh, so if I just took a straight average of this highly materialist person, seven, and they're seven, and they're one, uh, it would give me a score somewhere between, somewhere in the middle of the scale. And, and that doesn't reflect who this person is. This person is a materialist. They need to have a high score to this reversed item, not a low score. So I need to flip their items. Uh, now, if you look at it, there's an easy trick for reversing items. So if items are scored one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, I need to turn that one into a seven, and that two into a six, and that three into a five, and so on. Uh, if, if you have a seven point scale and you do a set it as eight minus that score, um, let's move this over. Yeah, I'm going to say eight, um, and I'm going to set this as equal to eight minus one, that's with seven. Um, whoops. Yeah. Um, eight, right? Um, so let's paste this here. Turns out it works perfectly. So this number needs to be one more than the maximum number of scales in, in the item. So if it's a seven point scale, you use eight. If it's a nine point scale, you use 10. If it's a five point scale, you use six. Um, uh, because eight minus one is seven, and eight minus seven is one. So uh, it's this neat trick to perfectly reverse uh, the items. So I can delete those now. Um, so what I've done is, if you look at this, I've pasted in something here that flags with an asterisk which items are reversed. So this one's reversed, this one is reversed, this one is reversed. Um, now. Trying to type out all of that syntax for all of those lines um, gets really tedious if you've got a whole lot of scales and a bunch of subscales in them, because these are subscales. S is success, C is centrality, H is happiness. These are subscales of, of the materialism scale. So he, here's my trick for making them really quickly. You use Excel. You, talk, you have compute, and then you copy and paste that down a bunch of times, and then a name like Matt Wan mat dash mat dash and then in excel the quick way to make consecutive numbers is you write one two um and then if you grab the bottom right corner there's a dot and if you grab that and pull it down and it's only the bottom right corner it continues the pattern for you so it fills in the one two three four five six seven eight um so then uh you know you can grab those names and paste them in here. And what I'm doing is I'm spelling, spelling out the syntax that I need. And, and here's the magic. There's this function called concatenate. And so I'm going to concatenate this cell and this cell, comma, this cell. I'm just typing commas between these, comma, comma. And you can see up here that this is what I've typed out. And then we'll put a close bracket on the end, enter, and what it does is it just pastes all of those cells into one string of letters. Um, so compute mat1 equals q23 um, underscore 1.1, close bracket, and that full stop to end the line. Uh, don't forget the full stops. You'll find you, you forget the full stops a lot. This will be a frequent reason that your code breaks. So you paste these, um, cut and paste it, and, and here uh, I've now got a bunch of syntax made. So if I copy that, and then I open up my syntax file here, oh, and I paste it in, um, I've got a bunch of pre-made syntax for me that would have been very, very tedious to type out by hand. Uh, now, notice I did something else here, which is, um, let's... Uh, I have this flag for items that are supposed to be reversed. 
So what I've done here is on the ones that are supposed to be reversed, um, I put in an 8 minus there, so the line comes out reading compute mat3 equals 8 minus q23 underscore 3.0. Um, so, uh, and I've just made sure that on the lines which I need to reverse them, I put my 8 minus there. Um, so my new my, my new scale that will be computed um, will, will happily reverse all of the items just as if needed. Now, I've, you know, so if you look at this, all this code is doing here is turning, it is turning Q2311, which looks like junk, into materialism one, materialism two, materialism three. So we're getting a separate score for each materialism item. Right now, I have not made the scale at all yet. Um, so then what I can do is I can make a new one, compute materialism S for success equals, um, and by the way, I have that as, if you just put an equal sign in, in Excel, it'll think you're computing a, a, a formula. So I have space equals space in there. <laughs> or you could start with a, an apostrophe and that will also work. Um, mean, and then mean mat one, two, three, four, five, because one, two, three, four, five are the success items and six, seven, eight, nine, ten 10 are the success items. And in fact, I've done this by concatenating things uh, <laughs> up here. Uh, you can tell uh, how I've done it, although if you only have a few of them, you could type it in by hand. And then, um, you know, uh, again, concatenate, uh, uh, string those all together into one string, and put it into, where are we, Excel, as well as my syntax file, um, paste it in here. No, nope. uh, let's try that again. Um, Control C, syntax file, control V. Right, so now I have something. Now, if I run this on its own, I'll run into a problem. It'll say, mat1, you know, it'll it'll run these, and then it'll, it'll decide that mat1 doesn't exist yet. So what I want to do, and this is, again, just thinking through your code. I'm going to put an execute here, so it'll calculate all of those and execute, then run them, and then those variables and now mat1, mat2 will start to exist. And then when that variable exists, now I can come along and combine mat1, 2, 3, 4, 5 into a single scale uh, for materialism components. And then I can make, whoops, another item. Where are we here? Oh, yeah. And I can say, I can even type it out by hand if I want to compute materialism equals Oh, mean, mat s, mat c, mat h, full stop, don't forget the full stop, and again, I probably need to put an execute in here first so that when it runs that line, th these variables exist. And now I have something that which, when I select this all and run it, it'll go bang, bang, boom, and it will spit out a bunch of um, nicely formatted variables for me. Uh, and one of the advantages, the big advantages of doing it this way is sometimes you download your data and then you compute a bunch of scales uh, and you do some analysis even, and then you find that you've, you've run a couple more people or you mess something up. So you re-download your data. And if you've computed your scales by going through the menus every time and going, <laughs> transform, compute variable, uh, type in a variable name mat s equals, and then mean, and then type t these in. You have to do it all over again, because when you've downloaded the new data, you've lost it. Whereas if you've saved your syntax, you download the new data file, and then you just select your existing syntax, and you can save, run it, and boom, all, all of your variables are instantly recreated. Um, and you can save these um, syntax files, and, and they just save as a text file. You can open it with WordPad on your computer and, and, and edit it directly if you want to. Um, so let me see. Uh, was there anything else I wanted to cover with computing scales? Uh, da, 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 da. Um, yeah, and, and if you're ever not sure um, how, how you want to do something, you can always go back to compute scales and then put something in there and then hit paste. Um, 
and it will pop the syntax here and then you can work with it and go, oh yeah, that's how you do it and, and you know, delete it or copy it and paste it and recreate it and, and, and change it around. Okay, so I've covered number one, checking your raw data. Uh, I've covered number two, computing your scales, which is something where if you've got a lot of them, that, that'll take you a couple of hours to, to build all of the syntax and test it and make sure it works. Uh, now you've computed your scales, step three uh, is to check them uh, and make sure your, your scales look about right. Now, in your analytics course, they will have told you lots and lots and lots of uh, tests you can run for all kinds of different eventualities. Uh, I'm not going to walk you through all of those again. Um, you, you can look at your notes, you can find tutorials online. I'm just going to show you the real minimal basics that you want to look for. Um, uh, so the first thing you want to do, uh, and I've got some computed scales here like loyalty, pluck, demand, best first, was, did they have this scale first? I mean, I, I tagged this zero and one and one and zero, one and one, 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 zero. Um, is you want to start looking, um, so one issue is you want to make sure that you don't have any ceiling or floor effects. So you want to go to analyze, and then about the second option is descriptive statistics. And so if you've got uh, something categorical like which were you shown success or failure, um, then you can look at frequencies and, and it'll show you 60% of the time they saw failure and 40% of the time they saw success. Um, and it's worth checking that. Um, I had an experiment where participants were assigned to look at different products and I had you know, 12 different products, but I wanted there to be about an even number of people who were exposed to each product. And so when I, when I ran the frequency you know, how many people saw each product, uh, because there was a variable called product and the codes were 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6, 7, 8, 9, 10, 11, 12, 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, right? Um, what I found is that there were lots and lots of people had seen a bookstore and very few people had seen the Wall Street Journal, which was a different. Um, and, and so my randomization hadn't worked very well. And so I was able to go back and try and correct it and run some more people in the specific conditions I was lacking um, because I had checked the frequencies. Um, now, if you have something that's a scale, so it's like materialism or BESC, where you know it's a one to seven score, then the frequencies won't be very helpful because, in fact, just for fun, let's do that. Frequencies, um, the frequency is like how frequent was each given option? Um, and let's run it for materialism. <laughs> okay. Uh, <laughs> and what you see is, uh, <laughs> lots of people put one uh, for material, and the reason it says well, lots of people have one is because it's hiding decimal places. This is like you know 1.01, .01, and this will be 1.03, and this will be 1.09, and this will be 1.12 or something. So there's one person who gave each of this, and then you know there were three people who <laughs> had 3.07 or whatever this is, or 3.25, or um, so it's not very useful looking at frequencies for a, a continuous variable. So if you've got a continuous variable, uh, you don't want to know how many times each possible um, option was chosen. You, you want to look at um, data transform uh, for analyze. You want to look at the descriptives, which is the second option. So let's take the descriptive for materialism. Um, and you can choose several of them, and let's take BESC and subjective well-being, and you can just choose a whole lot of them all at once, and pluck. Um, and we'll see options, what have we got here? Mean, standard deviation, minimum, maximum, but you can choose other things. You can choose kurtosis and skewness, those are good things to check. Uh, style, uh, oh, that's also highlighting your uh, syntax, don't worry about bootstrapping. Um, and we'll just hit OK here. Now, instead of for every single possible score materialism, uh, it tells you materialism, n equals 194, minimum 1, maximum 7. Uh, so it was a 7-point scale, BESC 1, BESC 5. So either it was a 5-point scale or it was a 7-point scale and nobody went to 7. But I think it was really a 5-point scale. And it tells you what the mean is um, and the standard deviation. So 
it's worth looking at this um, subjective well-being minus nine to twenty-one. Uh, now you've got to think about this: is minus nine a legitimate score for your scale? Right. So if I saw a materialism scale and and someone had scored minus nine in it, I would be really worried because you you can't get you know that would mean maybe I hadn't reversed items or I'd done something silly or. or uh, Qualtrics had scored it in a really weird way. Um, I would be really worried if I saw a minus, uh, you know, a, a negative number for materialism because there are no negative numbers in the scale. Like it's not possible for a participant to check minus five. Um, so uh, that would be cause for me to go back and look and find out what went wrong. Because um, if I analyzed it and, and it was computed in a weird way, I, I wouldn't be analyzing anything real. I'd be analyzing some weird data gremlin. It turns out with subjective well-being, um, SWB, you calculate it as positive affect minus negative affect plus life satisfaction. So it is actually possible for someone to get a negative score. So that's nothing to worry about. Um, Pluck is again calculated with adding and subtracting. So it's possible to have negative scores. So you, you can look at like, are, are the minimum and maximum sensible? Another thing you can look for is the mean. Now, it's maybe not obvious until you think about it, but you want the mean to be somewhat close to the middle of the scale. Because if I looked at the mean of materialism and materialism was from one to seven and my mean was six point something, what that would mean is most people were putting sevens and a couple of people were putting sixes and nobody was putting really anything much lower than that because if you have a one to seven scale and, and, and a mean of six, that would mean that you're just averaging mostly sixes and sevens. I mean, mathematically, that's just how it has to be. And what that would mean is, is you have a ceiling effect. What that would mean is when you try and use materialism to predict something or to be predicted by something, it's going to be really hard to find a significant effect because everybody's giving you the same two answers. Everyone's saying materialism six or materialism seven. Nobody's saying three, nobody's saying four, nobody's saying two. And, and, and it's very hard to predict something when, when there's no variance in it. Um, and I'll give you a, a quasi-famous example of this. It turns out there's a, a test that they use for grad school, getting into grad school in, in, in North America a lot, called the GREs. So you write these GREs and it gives you a score for your verbal and it gives you a score for math and, and something else, analytic, I think. If you take a look at PhD students and uh, you look at how well they're doing and then you look at their GRE scores, you find there's very little correlation. So the ones who are doing really, really well don't seem to have GRE scores that are any different than the ones who aren't doing so well. And you might think that's a bit strange because in order to get accepted to their PhD program, they had to write these GREs and then um, they were selected but on the basis of these GREs, you know, one of the things that, you know, to accept you to a PhD program, you did really well on your GREs. Ah, well, we should have you in our program because you're smart. So if the GRE results don't really correlate with how you're doing in grad school, does that mean that grad schools should stop looking at GREs? Does that mean that GREs are, are worthless for predicting who will do well in grad school, so just stop using them? M maybe. But... It turns out that there's a little bit of an issue here, which is if you get a really bad score on your GREs, generally you don't get into grad school. So the people who get into their PhD programs are all people who did either sort of well or really well on their GREs. So when you use GRE scores to predict how well people are doing in grad school and in their PhD program, what you're testing is, does it matter if you do well or really well on your GREs? And it turns out it doesn't. Um, but if you do really badly on your GREs, maybe then you would, um, maybe then you would do badly in grad school. Um, but we don't have those people in grad school, so we can't see that. We don't know. Um, so if you looked at the people, you know, the grad students' uh, GRE scores, you would see that the the mean was 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 fairly close to the maximum, uh, and that would be uh, what we call a range restriction with a, a ceiling effect. Uh, so. If you look at your data and you see that one of your numbers is like that, um, you can go and look closely at your data and you can go to here and you, you'll see 
that on this variable you've got mostly sixes and sevens and that'll be y or mostly eights and nines or, or whatever it is um, and that that is a variable that you, you're going to find it doesn't predict much uh, it'll have uh, and that might mean that there really is nothing to do with it or it might mean that just mathematically it was measured badly uh, and that's why it doesn't predict anything much so uh, you want to look out for and also if you have a very mean very close to the minimum or the maximum you'll probably have a very low standard deviation because there's not a lot of variance everyone's just giving the same few scores so that that's something big to watch out for uh, now the, the next thing uh, that you, you want to look for when you have scales um, where we analyze is, is uh, you want to look at their alpha so uh, you'll find it under analyze uh, scale and the first option is reliability analysis um, so you, again you can find variables and put them in here but with the reliability analysis you, you don't put the finished variable scale in here you put um, the items that make it so you'd have materialism 1, materialism 2, materialism 3 you put those in here um, so uh, and then the statistics you can look at here um, one of the useful ones to have is scale if item deleted and I'll show you what that does in a second uh, continue uh, again I'm not going to press OK I'm going to press paste and that will have if I look at my syntax file over here right there you go there's the command reliability variables equals these four different variables scale all variables model alpha summary total um, uh, so if I select that and run it donk, donk, here I am and so it's cases there are 186 valid cases and eight excluded cases um, has list wise deletion right so there were four eight cases where they were missing data on at least one question and so they've been eliminated so it tells me my overall alpha for the scale is 0.730 which is okay, um, not great, but okay, uh, it's passable. Uh, one of the things about alpha, one of its quirks, is the more items you have, the higher alpha tends to be all else equal. So if you have an item with scale of 15 items, it will tend to have a higher alpha. Uh, and then you've got this, this table down here, because I asked for if item was deleted, it's, it's produced this extra output. Uh, so it says the scale mean if this item is deleted, um, so this one must have quite a uh, a low score because uh, if I deleted it, the mean would go up quite a lot. Um, scale variance, corrected item total correlation. But this last one here, um, Cronbach's alpha if item deleted is sometimes worth looking at. So if I deleted the first one, the alpha for the scale would go from 730 to 734. Wouldn't make much difference. Uh, if I deleted the second one, it would go from 730 to 563. So clearly, this item block identified is, is doing a lot of work to uh, get the item mean to where it is. Um, and sometimes what you'll see is if you've got something with you know, mediocre alpha, um, there'll be one item where if you delete it, the alpha gets much, much better. And then you might think that that item is worth getting rid of. Um, or at least you can make an argument that perhaps you should because it's not predicting the same thing as everything else or maybe it's measuring it badly or maybe it's adding a part of the variance that really should be there uh, but that's something that you have to put your thinking hat on and understand what you're measuring and understand the questions that people are answering and understand what's going on in their heads and are the answers that they're giving you lining up with what's in their heads um, so you'll, you'll want to compute alpha for your different scales. Uh, let's think. Um, then uh, another thing, another test that you'll want to run for your scales, especially your bigger, more important ones, analyze dimension reduction factor analysis. This is an exploratory factor analysis, or EFA, where you don't tell the computer what dimensions to use, you, you just uh, let it work out what it should be. 
Um, so I'm going to pick these four items here. No very no clock items. Um, descriptives. Mm, yeah, that's fine. There's a couple of things that you want to work out here. Extraction. So right now it's doing it based on eigenvalues. Sometimes um, we'll come back to that. We'll come back to that. Here's the one you definitely want to check. You want to do a rotation. Um, Veramax is the most popular one. Um, uh, and, and for our purposes, we'll just leave it at that. Pure methodologists would be having a heart attack if I told you to just always do a Veramax rotation, but there are no pure methodologists here. <laughs> uh, so continue and scores. Um, the, 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 options. Uh, th there's a really handy one here, suppress small coefficients. Uh, so I usually do it below about 0.4. Uh, continue, it just makes the table easier to read. And then I'm going to paste. We'll paste it again because that means we can always recreate our analysis later. Here are we doing? Okay. Uh, and we will select our factor analysis and we'll run it, see what happens. Boom. Uh, right, I mean, this is a scale with only four items. <laughs> uh, so, uh, it's of somewhat limited interest. Um, make that thing go away. Uh, so, the things to look for um, as a real crash course is communalities. Uh, how many factors? Uh, so, the default option is it computes these eigenvalues and it'll compute one uh, factor for every uh, component that has an eigenvalue of greater than one. So this is just SPSS guessing how many factors to have, taking an educated guess. Uh, and in this case, it, it, it picks out two factors, um, which it turns out is actually the right number. But oftentimes it will get that wrong. And so uh, you'll want to, you'll, you'll look at the component, you'll look at this the solution it comes up with, and then you say, yeah, but what if we add a factor? What if we add a factor? And then you'll go back to analyze, and uh, da, 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 where are we? Dimension reduction factor, and then you'll say uh, extraction. Okay, don't just go eigenvalues greater than one. Give me a fixed number of factors. Give me three, three, whoops, not this, three, three factors. Okay, continue, and then okay, let's see what that looks like now. Okay. Um, uh, now I'll come back to the, the, the one I did with two factors here. So the first one is the unrotated matrix, uh, and the short answer is just ignore that. Uh, look at the rotated matrix. Um, and the reason there's missing values here is I told it to hide anything that's less than four. So this number is probably 0.2 something, and this is probably 0.3 something, or minus 0.3 something. But um, I said, don't, don't show me anything that's less than four. And so what I see is that Plot intrinsic and identified load on one factor 0 0.94 and 0 0.84 and plot introjected and plot extrinsic load on another factor 0 0.876 and 0 0.900. Um, and if you know how the plot scale works, then you are very happy because that's exactly what should have happened <laughs> with that scale. It's supposed to have an intrinsic component with these two items and an extrinsic component with these two items. Um, and uh, often when you do a factor analysis, especially if you have lots of factors, um, so like in materialism, there's three factors, uh, and in some other scales, there's more. Um, and especially if your sample size isn't enormous, um, you can get quite a bunch of bounce and gremlins. And so here's when, uh, when I force it to say three factors, uh, it picks out one for intrinsic and identified, and then it, it's, it forces extrinsic and interjects it onto separate ones. Um, uh, so you can you can toy around with that with your your variables, and you can you can start to get a sense of the shape of your data, which is a strange thing to say. But when you start playing with data, you'll you'll see what I mean by it. Um, one warning is, especially if your sample size is you know less than two hundred or even three hundred. Don't overinterpret. If one item loads a bit in the wrong place, or you know, one item loads on a, two variables when it should just load on one, um, that might be a problem with the factor structure of the data, or it might just be 
um, that you've not got enough sample size to get a completely consistent, coherent solution, um, or that your participants weren't paying enough attention to really discriminate these fine gradations that are there in your questioning that they just didn't pick up. Um, so if your sample size isn't staggering, um, and you've got a factor and so analysis with like lots of factors in it uh, and complicated things, and it doesn't come out quite perfectly, uh, just don't panic because uh, factor analysis does have a certain amount of bounce in it. Right? Um, this is just the computer looking at numbers, columns of numbers, and trying to find the where they clump uh, and trying to find variables that clump together. And if they don't clump quite right um, in, in some small way, that can throw things off a little bit. So it, it's a useful thing to look at, but don't, uh, don't don't overly panic and overly interpret it, especially if your sample size isn't huge. Right. Mm -hmm. I'm going to show you a really interesting trick I discovered. Because if you remember, um, one of the well, one of the problems you run into is you run a bunch of participants, but you know some of them pay close attention and answer each question carefully, and some of the time, you know, some participants just start going through and just clicking like numbers to get through the um, your survey. They start going five, five, six, 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 five, six, 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 seven, five, six, 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 six seven, five, uh, done. Okay, good. Haha, <laughs> I'm finished. I've given my data. I can move on with my life. So what I found, um, and no one that I know of has, has published this, but it's a trick I found actually works pretty well. If you have a scale like materialism, uh, materialism works for any scale where some of the items are reversed, but you otherwise have like a pretty good alpha. What you can do um, is so compute scores for each of the items where um, they're reversed appropriately. Uh, so, you know, materialism one, materialism two. So the items are, then what you can do is you can go through and you can make an average of all of the items which are not reversed. But, uh, I'll get rid of that one. Yeah. So you, 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 you compute the scale and I'm just sort of clicking on Excel here. Um, instead of computing, right? Um, and so you compute one scale, which is all the not reversed items, and a second version of the scale, which is all of the reversed items. And it doesn't matter if they're in different facets, um, so long as the scale has a good overall alpha. And then you take those two numbers and you subtract one from the other. It doesn't matter which order you do them in. And what you find is that if people have been paying attention, then those numbers from the reversed items and from the not reversed items should all be about the same. So if they were giving 555, five, five, then when they got to a reversed item, they probably gave like a 2. And then when they got to a not reversed item, they gave a 5. And then a reversed item, they gave a 2. If you reverse those, then you should see just, you know, 5s and 6s and 4s and, you know, all the way down the line. And uh, so when you take an average of their reversed items and their not reversed items, you should get a score that's around about zero or not far off zero. But if they were just kind of clicking through and not really paying attention, uh, they went, you know, five, 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 and then they got the reversed items and they were still clicking five. So when you reverse it, that five turns into a, a two. Uh, and then, uh, so if they've done that systematically, and they've given sort of like four, five, six to everything, four, five, six, four, five, six, four, five, six, when you reverse the items, their not reversed items have an average of five, and their reversed items have an average of like two. So five minus two gets you a score of three. And what I find is, if you calculate it that way, the people who have scores of three and four on this scale um, when I have like a, a, another question in there that like captures were they paying attention, the people who have three and four on, on this scale, they're the ones who get uh, who, who fail the manipulation checks items. So I mean, I, I had a, an item where I asked them, 
questions that, that there was an objective right answer to, like, is a Converse high top a, a branded item? And the answer is yes. And if you write, no, it's not branded, you're just not paying attention, you're not thinking it through. So I have a couple of questions like that. And what I find is the people who get those questions wrong, where there is a def definite right answer, they're the ones who have this big spread on, on materialism between their reversed and their not reversed answers, because they weren't paying attention when they there was a reverse. They didn't give low answers to the reverse items and high answers to the or, or vice versa. Um, so this is a little trick that that you can do, and uh, so you, you compute this score. And if people have got three or four, if people have got really high scores on this, then you just exclude them from your analysis. You say these people were not paying attention. I shouldn't interpret their numbers because the numbers they gave are, are, are just junk. It's just them clicking on numbers and not reading my questions and thinking about what they mean and giving an honest answer. Um, so I hope my explanation there is, is clear enough. It's completely clear in my head. <laughs> and hopefully I haven't confused you by just describing it with words. Uh, and if not, then don't worry about it. It's just a nice trick that you can pull off. Okay, so number one, I told you about checking your raw data. Number two, talked about computing scales. Number th three, uh, checking your scales, um, ceiling effects, alphas, uh, factor analysis. Number four, uh, analyze the data. So once you've got it, all, all sorted out to your satisfaction. And I mean, in your analytics course, we told you about lots of tests I didn't tell you about here, and, and you can, by all means, go into those and, and, and clean your data even more precisely. Uh, there are, let me think about this. In all of statistics, there are only ever two questions. There's a million different tests you can do, but really only two questions. One of them is, is this set of numbers higher or lower than another set of numbers? And the other question, question number two is, does this set of numbers move together with another set of numbers or does it move in an opposite pattern or does it move in an unrelated way? Um, and the reason you've got a million tests isn't because there are more questions than that. It's just because our statistics aren't very good. <laughs> uh, our math isn't very good, and so depending on, uh, you know, we, we can come up with, if you make a bunch of assumptions, I can come up with some mathematical operations that will test whether this set of numbers are, are different than another set, but if if those assumptions aren't quite right, then the test doesn't work anymore, and I have to come up with another test that will fit that pattern of numbers. Um, so th this isn't because that's how numbers are supposed to work, it's just our math isn't very good. So when you want to say, is one group of numbers different than another? Um, that's where you want to run a t-test. So um, if I look through my variation, I have, uh, let me see, gender. Gender is something where I have one and two, and uh, if I've downloaded, if I labeled it correctly, you know, one would show up as male and two as female, or, or vice versa. I don't know. I'd have to check which way I put it. Um, but I can go to analyze. Uh, compare means and uh, independent samples t-test. So one sample t-test is um, uh, is is the average of gender different than. In fact, let's let's do it. Uh, gender um, and there's a test value of zero, uh, and and so it's going to test is the average gender score different than zero, and it will be because. If you look at it, every single answer is one or two. Um, so maybe I'll even put a value, a test value of 1.5 in here is, because um, if there's an exactly equal number of men and women, the average score should be 1.5. That's okay, take a look at this. And what we find is uh, mean is 1.43, uh, which is slightly lower than 1.5, but is it significantly different than 1.5? And the answer is, uh, T significance 0.057. Uh, it's n you know, normally our criteria for significance is 0.05, P less than 0.05. So um, I, I reject the null hypothesis, and I say, or I accept the null hypothesis. Sorry, and I would say that um, there probably is a fairly even split of men and women here. Uh, to, to, to analyze. 
But if I want to compare, let's say, do men and women have higher materialism scores? Okay, where am I? Uh, compare means independent samples. So men are one sample, women are the other sample, independent samples. Uh, so I need a grouping variable, which is who are my groups of people, and that would be gender. Whoops. Duh, duh, gender. Uh, my test variable, I said materialism, right? So are men more materialistic than women? And we can put a couple of them. How about BESC? Are men and women different than BESC? Uh, oh, and I have to actually tell it what the groups are. So group one is one, two. You can also do it with a cut point. So anything higher than 1.5 or lower than 1.5. Um, but I'll do it with my specified values, one and two. Continue. And now I can I could go paste and save. Well, I just have to paste. Uh, blah, 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 blah. Yeah, here we go, t-test. Um, by the way, when you have your syntax, sometimes you know, when you're when you when you creating the syntax, you know what everything means. But then you look at it three a week later and you forget why why on earth did I write this? You can write comments. So if you put an asterisk or a star, um, this is a test of something. Uh, and then a full stop closes the line. Um, when I select that line, it does nothing because uh, SPSS says oh, starts with an asterisk, ends with a period. It's just a comment. So you can write lots of notes to yourself about what you found. Um, you can uh, make visual barriers in it. You can say, okay, main analysis stuff here. Wee, oh. So that when you look at it later, um, you go, oh yeah, yeah, yeah. This is where all these analyses are. So wait, let's run this now. Bonk. Uh, so let's see. Materialists. Oh, we got 111 gender one and 81 of gender two. So 111, I think, men. 81 women. Uh, and there's the mean is 3.89 for men and 3.82 for women, so that's <laughs> within 0.7, that's probably going to, or 0.07, <laughs> that's not going to be significant. And if you look down, sure enough, 0.85, it's not. Uh, for material, for BASC, mean 2.79, 2.83, that, that's very similar numbers. And again, yep, that's not significant, 0.902. Um, oh, that's the test of equality of variance um, in your analysis course we'll talk about the, the significance for the equality of the means do they have the same mean um, significance 0 0.699 0 0.803 I mean again not significant uh, and then you have confidence intervals so it seems to be between minus 2.79 and 4.16 it's a 90 and so zero fits in the confidence interval so you you, you can't conclude that your answer is different than zero. So it looks like materialism at best, there's no difference on gender. So you've got group one, group two, and how is their score on something different than something else? Uh, that's a t-test. And so sometimes you will have tests like that. How is group one different than group two, or group three and four and five? And that's where you have ANOVAs. Um, so that's the test one. I told you I told you about three main tests. Test one, t-test. Next one, correlation. Um, this is a test of are these numbers moving together, or are they not? So analyze, correlate. You are going to be doing bivariate correlations. There are other kinds, but for your purposes, we're sticking to bivariate. Bivariate just means two variables, bivariate. Uh, okay, and so I've already put in some variables here, PLOC and BESC and materialism. You could put in more, you can put in less. You can put in as many as you like, options. Mm. Exclude cases pairwise is actually a good thing to have because that says it'll only exclude a case if, if, if it's missing data for one of those two variables. But if it's missing data for, you know, if, if someone's missing data for materialism, um, but they've got values for BESC and PLOC, it'll still tell you what the correlation is, including them on, on that test. It'll just skip it when materialism wants. Okay. Continue two tail test of significance, um, and again, paste. Um, blah, blah, blah. Right, um, correlations plot, and you can even type in other variables here and say, give me 
poll in trim or something. Um, so you can cut and paste this and add type in variables and delete variables and move them around um, as much as you like. Um, so let's look at this uh, correlation matrix. So you've got the matrix and it's the same on the top as on the bottom. Um, you've seen these before, I'm sure. So clock and desk, not really correlated. 0.095 is their co correlation coefficient. 0.197, not signaling, right? Clock and materialism, really not correlated, but um, desk and materialism, 0.387. And that's typically what you get. They tend to correlate sort of 0 0.380, 0 0.440, 0 0.450. That's typically what you get but for desk and materialism. Um, let's add another one in. So let's go, um, yeah, correlate by varia. Let's add in uh, subjective well-being. Well, okay, because we know that, I mean, people have for years and years said that materialists are less happy than other people, but what about those who are high in BESC? Uh, let's run that, and then, uh, won't you, don't you know it? Yeah, materialists, minus 214. Yeah, so they're less happy, and people who are high in BESC are actually more happy. That's interesting. Um... Let's add another variable in here just to see what we've got here. Yep, 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 yep. Um, loyal, right. So are you more loyal to your phone brand if you're a BESC or a materialist? Um, so let's see, Pluck. Oh, people who are high in Pluck are a bit more loyal. People who are high in BESC, 0.403, they're really loyal. Happy people are more loyal. Uh, materialists, not so much. Um, well, yeah, it's interesting. Yeah, you would have thought that they should be in it. In other data sets, they often are a little bit with materialism, but but not in this one. Um, okay, but, but let, let, let's look at this a little bit. Um, so we know that people who are hmm, High in plock. Hmm. Uh, okay, so Yeah, let's do kind of something interesting. So look, we know that people who are high in plaque are happier, and they're also more loyal. Um, but we also know that people who are happier are, are more loyal too. So are they happy uh, because they're high in plaque, or are they happy because they're high in uh, uh, you know? Loyalty, uh, right, so you've got, let, let's say that our, our dependent measure, our outcome measure is loyalty. We're interested in who's loyal to products. And we know that point, point 0.28, people who are high in plock are a bit more loyal, and also that people who are happier are more loyal. But we also know up here that people who are um, happier are also higher in plock. Um, so maybe it's just the overlap between those variables and you can think of it as like a venn diagram on its own correlation will never ever sort that out for us because correlation is just one variable and another variable and then one variable and another variable it just looks at the pairs of, of variables in in total isolation but what we need to know is not uh, we need to know what happens with these two predictors if, if you use them at the same time to predict an outcome uh, and can you separate out their overlap on, on this outcome? And this is where you analyze regression, uh, and, and for your purposes, linear. We'll, we'll, we'll do you, I mean, there's a lot of different kinds of it, um, but, but for our purposes, linear regression is all we're going to use. So we can have one variable as an outcome variable, a dependent variable, um, and then, well, let's start off, first of all, I'm going to do only plot. So you have one independent variable and one dependent variable. Uh, and I'm 
I'm just going to, well, let's paste it. Uh, get used to using paste, right? Um, so here's our command here. Variable missing list wise, right? Dependent loyal method, enter block, and that's our independent variables. So first we'll run this and see what we've got. So sure enough, we find blah, 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 blah. The overall table is significant. Um, Plock, um, standardized coefficient beta, 0.282, significant 0 0.000. Now, if you come back to this correlation coefficient, loyalty and plock, 0 0.282, 0 0000, it's the same number. It's the exact same number. Here is one of the insights. A regression with one independent variable is exactly, mathematically, exactly identical to a correlation coefficient. It's the same test, not, not even close or similar. It's literally mathematically identical. You'll have exactly the same coefficient uh, and exactly the same significance level. Uh, so sometimes I see students and they'll do correlations between two variables and then they'll do a regression where one variable predicts one outcome variable and they'll say, ah, no, with regression, it's still significant. And you shake your head because what they've done is the exact same test twice. And of course it gives the same answer. It's the same test. But what regression will let us do, that correlation will not let us do, um, is regression. Well, in fact, let's do it with syntax now. We can add in... Um, more than one. So let's have plot and subjective well-being uh, and run this. Boom. So now all of a sudden we have sim plot and subjective well-being simultaneously predicting loyalty, uh, dependent variable loyalty. Uh, and what we find here is PLOC 194 and subject of well-being 120. Those are the unstandardized coefficients. Um, for our purposes right now, we'll stick with a standardized coefficient because um, it's easier to compare with a correlation. Um, 0.205 for PLOC. Let's come up here. PLOC is perceived locus of causality, for those who care. Um, PLOC and loyal 282. And here it's dropped to 205 from 282. This one, it's plock and subjective well-being is 335. And up here, subjective one is 382, dropped to 335. So what you're seeing is this, the coefficients are no longer identical. They've gotten smaller. And the reason they've gotten smaller is because each of those variables, part of them uniquely predicts the outcome variable, but part of them predicts the outcome variable in common with the other one. And so what the regression is trying to do is it's trying to say, okay, this part that you predict the outcome variable in common, we're just gonna divide it up and we're going to try and figure out who gets credit for that shared variance and then we'll give you most of that credit. Um, and so what you see is these numbers shrinking and so sometimes you'll have a significant relationship in the correlation and then when you put it in the very you know in, in a regression with another variable that's more strongly related to that dependent variable it'll drop to nothing uh, and what that's telling you is you you've got probable mediation um, uh, now let's do one more um, let's do um, We'll keep loyal as a dependent variable. Instead of plock and subjective rigging, we're going to do materialism and BASC. And we'll run this and we'll see how this goes. Now, materialism negatively related to loyalty, BASC positively related. So Let's see if we can remember these numbers. Let's compare it to the correlation coefficients. We've got 497 and minus 246. There's our correlation coefficient. Here we go. So 497 for BASC, 403. Um, 387 for materialism. It's gotten smaller there too. In fact, actually it's gotten a bit, bit bigger because it 
uh, you've got a suppression effect. Now, let me see. Material is going to block. Uh, let's try it again. This is what I was thinking of. Material is going to block. Let's have material is going to block one more time. I'm going to try this linear block and materialism. Let's add that. This is an interesting one to do, and you'll see why in a second. So loyalty being predicted by materialism and block. Okay. Um, materialism minus 0 0.055 block 282. Uh, uh, materialism and loyalty. Where are we? Um, 0 0.055 and Clock and loyalty, 282. So you see those numbers are actually the same, 282 and 0555. You, why is it that they didn't drop there? Every other time we had two predicting the same thing, the, the coefficient was dropping because it was dividing up variance between them. But here it hasn't dropped at all. And the answer is, if you look up here, the correlation between materialism and clock is minus 0 0.001, which is basically zero. So there is no overlap between materialism and clock, just none at all in this score. So when regression tries to sort out uh, the overlap between them, their common explanation they have of, of loyalty, there isn't any. There is no variance that's shared between them. There is no in common explanation that needs to be divided up. So um, it, it says, you know, it's like having, a, 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 in that case, a regression is like having two independent correlation tests. Um, there is no overlap to adjust for, so it gives you the, the exact same answer pretty much over again. Um, so that is my crash course in regression. Now, there's two wrinkles that I'm going to cover now, and then we're going to call it quits. Uh, the first wrinkle is uh, some of you have tests of mediation. So variable A causes variable B, and variable B causes variable C. Um, so, you know, you can do a correlations and you can show that variable one, you know, variable one and two are linked to each other and variable two and three are linked to each other. But if you want to test the mediation, you want to open up, let's find a browser. Uh -huh. And, um, okay. Uh, and we are going to search for Sobel test. Um, and Right, uh, if we, the first hit is the Sobel test calculator. Calculation for the Sobel test. Um, and there are some words to the wise, only works well for large samples, remember. Um, if you have raw data bootstrapping up as a much better, um, uh, so it's not the exact best definite, you know, best way of doing it, there are better ways, but, um, uh, for our purposes, this will be our test of mediation, right? Uh, and so here's a, a mediation diagram, IV mediator DV, uh, and the direct effect between them. And this web page gives you, and you know, uh, instructions on how to get numbers. Run a regression analysis, the IV predicting a mediator, and that gives you A and SA. And there's a little table that you can fill in here, A, and then the standard deviation of A. Um, and you can type in numbers here, like 0.231 and, you know, 0.012, and these are numbers you would get from running a regression, and then, then you run another regression with the IV and the mediator, both as dependent variables predicting the DV, and that gives you B, B, uh, I'm just gonna make up fake numbers here, 0.339, and, uh, you know, SB, which is the standard error of B, uh, and there's a bunch of links that try and tell you how help you get the right get them from the right things and we'll call this point 082 um, and once you've entered those four numbers you hit calculate um, and it gives you the Sobel test um, p-value 0.03 um, 
So that's a very, very significant uh, mediation score, uh, which doesn't mean anything because I, I just gave fake data. But you would have real data you could put in here and you could get uh, tests and mediation. OK. Um, for moderation, um, this is where you have an interaction. Close all tabs. Moderation is trickier. Um, because moderation, uh, there's a couple of steps to follow. Now, if you Google it, you'll find web pages that give you advice, that give you a walkthrough and show you how to do it, and, and also show you how to plot out the answers. Um, and I highly recommend that you do that if you need to, because then you can get a walkthrough. But um, really quickly, um, before you can uh, before you do uh, a test for interaction, um, let, let's go to, there's our thing here, right? So if we have a regression with materialism and BESC predicting loyalty and we're predicting an interaction, we need to have materialism and BESC entered into regression and also a term that is the interaction between them. Uh, which you can call mat times BASC. Now, the problem that we first face is that that variable doesn't exist right now, so we have to calculate it. Uh, and the way you calculate it is you say compute materialism times, oh, right, um, wait, we need to call it mat times BASC equals mat times BASC. Don't forget the full stop. The full stop's important execute. Um, and if I run that, bonk, it will have created a variable, where are we, called mat times BASC. Now, there it is. Now, you're seeing some very big numbers here, 12, 18, 21, 23. That's because you're multiplying something with a 4 times a 1 and something with a 5 times 4.2 or something. Uh, it's actually, you know, you can run the test like this with this variable, but the numbers are very hard to interpret. It's much easier to interpret if you center the variables first. So what that means is you need to center each variable around zero. So if I, one of the things about correlation and regression is if I Compute a new variable. Let's go, in fact, let's do it right now. Compute a new variable, and we'll say mat plus 400, and we'll compute this as materialism plus 400. Whoops, 400. So every single, there we go, every single materialism score has just added 400 added to it here. If I go analyze, correlate by variate and let's add in to this test we had before we'll add in this new map plus 400 okay and what you see is that materialism plus 400 correlates 1.000 with materialism adding a constant to a bunch of numbers changes it doesn't change the correlations at all and it's correlation or minus 0.01, minus 0.01, 0 0.387, You can add numbers, you can subtract numbers, you can divide, you can multiply by anything. Uh, and it, because correlation looks only at the relationship that those numbers have with each other. Uh, and that relationship doesn't change. You know, a five is always bigger than two. Even if you add 100 to both of them, it becomes 105 compared to 102, but it's still pretty bigger. Um, so you can do these linear transformations, but what we're going to do here, instead of just adding some random number on, is we're going to go analyze descriptive statistics, get the descriptives for materialism and BASC. Who cares about that other stuff? Okay, and we need the means. So materialism 3.85, 
da, da, da. we're going to now compute compute mat centered and we're just and I even call it that I mean the mat C is fine equals materialism minus let's find what this number is here mean 3.85 and compute BASC centered, I'm too lazy to write out centered the whole way, equals BASC minus, and what's the mean of BASC? 2.8. And then we'll execute those. And then we can compute MAT times BASC, and instead of MAT times BASC, we will use MAT centered and BASC sensor equals remember what you called them uh, and when we run this now bonk we get it tells us it's run it and if we look at our data right so now our mat times best instead of being 23 and 5 it's 0.13 and 1.85 and 2.1 so now it's it's essentially on the same scale as materialism and best score so now we can come back to our thing. Um, and let's move this underneath here. So it's, it doesn't really matter, but just so that we can remember what we did later. You can see that we did the second. We've got our regression with loyalty and materialism basque, and materialism times basque. That's our interaction term. Uh, and we'll run that. Now, our regression, we've got our constant, 4.8689, and that just means it's different than zero. It's not a big deal. Materialism, minus 4.35. Um, so it's actually negatively predicting loyalty now, um, and that's because it's having a complicated suppressor effect with BASC. We won't go into that now. Um, you can read about that some other time if you want to. Um, minus 273, we'll use the standardized coefficients, minus 235. Desk 503, um, and this standardized coefficient, the interaction term, map times BESC 0.108, turns out it's not quite significant, 0.104. But if that was significant, if that was 0.02, p less than 0.05, put 0.02, 0 0.01, something like that, that would mean that we have a significant moderation effect. That would mean that the effect of materialism on loyalty is different depending on your level of BESC. Um, so in this data, we would not support that conclusion, and we would conclude that you just have an independent effect of the two of them, and you don't have an interaction between them. But if that was significant, then you conclude that you had significant moderation. Now, interpreting how what that interaction looks like, um, the way you do it is you plot out uh, the regression equation and you put in uh, hypothetical values. So just to show you really quickly, if you look at the unstandardized coefficients here, your regression equation for MAT and BESC and the interaction between them, your predicted loyalty score for any given person um, would be 4.679 minus 0.435 times whatever their materialism score is. So if I scored 7 out of 7, then it's minus 0.435 times 7, plus 1.044 times my best score. So if I my best score is 2, then it's you know plus 2.088. And MAT times best, plus an interaction score. So 0.162 times my materialism score of 7, times my best score of 2, and if you multiply all that out, um, that, that'll give you some number. Um, so if you add all those up, 4.679 plus minus 0.435 times 7, plus 1.044 times 2, plus 0.162 times 7 times 2, and you add those numbers all up, and it sounds like a lot, but Keep in mind, this is like high school math. This is something that you know you were doing in your second year of high school. Uh, it, it's a, like a really short equation. Like you multiply out the numbers and then you add them up. It's 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 
it sounds like a lot, but it's actually very easy. That would give you a predicted loyalty score for someone with that level of materialism and that level of Basque. Um, and so if you're going to plot it out, you would make a hypothetical person with high materialism and high Basque, and you'd work out what their predicted score is. And then you'd take another person, hypothetical person with a high materialism score and a low Basque score, and another hypothetical person with a low materialism and high Basque, and then another hypothetical person with low materialism and low Basque. And for each of them, you would plug in values into this equation and get a predicted loyalty score, and then you just plot that on a little graph and uh, connect the lines, uh, and that gives you a visual that, that you can interpret. And uh, I, I leave that as an exercise for you to work out, because um, it's hard to show on the computer here, but you can do it in Excel. Um, you can have Excel do all these calculations for you, um, and if you will find web pages that will even give you a little Excel script that will do it for you. Um, uh, and that is how you test moderation. So that's all I'm going to tell you about today. Um, but to summarize, finally recap. Step one, checking your raw data. Step two, compute scales. Step three, check your scales. Step four, analyze. Uh, and under analyze your data, we had t-tests uh, for differences between groups. We had correlation, uh, looking at uh, uh, individual pairs of variables. Uh, and by the way, correlation works okay with, with dichotomous data. So if you've got something where the answer is yes or no, or uh, threatened and not threatened, or um, successful and unsuccessful, you know, and so you've given a score of one and zero, or one and minus one, correlation will work just fine with that. Um, correlation does not work as if you have multiple, so if you have red, yellow, and green, and red is one, and yellow is two, and green is three. Um, correlation will assume that you mean that three is higher than one, but with red, yellow, and green, it's, it's nominal, uh, it, it's categorical data. It, it doesn't make any sense to analyze it that way. Um, uh, with regression, it's like correlation. It's okay with one and zero dichotomous variables. Um, with more than Three, with, with three or four or five levels, there is a way to do it, but it's more complicated, and we won't go into that now. Um, and then if you have mediation, so battle test, which you use uh, regressions to build, and if you have moderation, or if you're testing for moderation, then you need to test for interaction effects. So that's all I want to tell you about now, and I will sign off and uh, <laughs> let your head spin quietly on your own.